Hello, you're watching the Great Canadian Bagel here, and today I have the US 2024 post mortem. Now, before I begin, I'd like to once again shout out to my channel members. I really appreciate the guys, the support you guys give me. And really, all this stuff helps so much, and any little bit you can do will help quite a bit. So, if you guys want to support the channel, by all means, go down and link in the description before below and press that join button. Every little bit helps. Otherwise, just do your regular YouTube things. Like, share, subscribe, and comment below. With that, let us begin. So the U.S. election has happened, obviously. And, well, to not bury the lead here, I did pretty well. In fact, I really, in within reason, could not have possibly have done better here. So... At the time of recording this, there is still some vote counting to be done. I think we're like 99.99 something percent. So I'm calling it close enough. Don't really care about the rest of it. It doesn't really matter that much. Well, here we go. Here is what we got. So first, I have 100% state hit rate. I got every single state and every single uh, jury and the main at, in uh, Nebraska sub-districts all correct. And importantly, if we do the six party, that includes other uh, popular vote figures, I have a mean squared error of less than 0 0.1. Now, if we say, hey, that's not fair, having four small, three other, or sorry, four small parties is going to suppress your mean squared error, that's not a good metric. And we just lump these three parties, Libertarians, Greens, Kennedy, and other, Together, my mean squared error is only 0 0.31. Amazingly low. Remarkably low. Shockingly low. I don't think I could ever hit something like this on a reliable basis, especially if we're talking about this level. Maybe in American elections, presidential, I might be able to hit something like that on a regular basis because there's mostly just two parties. This is quite remarkable. And most of the other people doing things did not, doing forecasting, most of the big names didn't do super hot on accuracy. Now, some, like Real Clear, did perfectly fine. Others, like Decision Desk, did okay. Or Cook Report, sorry, and Decision Desk did okay. Silver Bulletin is like, eh, you're starting to get a little dicey. But 270 to win and 538, not so great. 538 particularly is terrible. 538 is nearly 3.2 points away from Trump's actual vote share. That's really bad. And notably, with all these other sites, a lot of these being the quote-unquote mainstream U.S. polling aggregates and models, all of them have the wrong popular vote winner. I did not. So I'm going to take a big victory lap on this one. I also have better seat hit rates than these guys, or state hit rates than these guys, but I don't really care about, ooh, sorry, apologies, that's just at my desk. I don't particularly care about comparing that. It's not that important. I already took my victory lap here. Now, what I think is quite interesting about this is this election, there's a couple things about it that I want to really touch on here. Now, the first as I think people are overdrawing conclusions from this election. Particularly, a bunch of people I've seen in the pundit or analyst sphere have been saying, oh, these things trended left compared to the national popular vote. I think that is a terrible way to consider states or consider trends. Trending compared to the popular vote is a very misleading thing to say. Now, that is not necessarily to say, perhaps, say Michigan, maybe it is slightly bluer than it was in 2020. Now, Trump still won it because Trump did much better than the popular vote. He had a, what, about six-point swing nationally and less than a six-point swing in Michigan. Okay. But the problem with a comparison like that 
is it really kind of undersells what actually happened nationally. It really obfuscates it. It's not so much that Michigan moved less than the country. It's that a few specific states swung massively. Those states being New Jersey. This is my actual final forecast map, by the way. This is not what this would be shaded as if this was as the final results. But anyways, I digress. New York, New Jersey, Florida, Texas, those four in particular, there's others, but those four in particular swung massively compared to the country at large. And in a very relevant way. New Jersey actually being more competitive than Arizona ended up being at the end of the day. Florida and Texas were less competitive than New York. At this stage, I think Florida actually is just a Republican state like Ohio. It should go Republican unless something crazy happens. Or perhaps you could put it in the same category as Texas. It should go Republican unless something remarkable happens. Whereas something like Wyoming should go Republican. Even a terrible Republican candidate should win Wyoming. It would be remarkable in this point if to lose Wyoming as a Republican. Or, in the Democrats' case, case, losing, say, D.C. or Maryland, you'd have to be really bad on a national election. Sure, state level, Republicans have won places like Maryland. They have won places like Massachusetts. But national level, you have to be either the best Republican or the worst Democrat for a Republican to win Maryland. Larry Horgan could not even win a Senate race against a generic Dem, and he's the most rep popular Republican statewide in Ma Maryland, perhaps. <clears throat> now, he did do pretty good for a Republican Senate candidate in Maryland, but he wasn't very close to winning. So, what I really want to stress here, though, is you should not compare states to national trends because if that means there's a big realignment in a different part of the country it obfuscates the actual movement in another part because hispanics broke or shifted super hard towards trump the trend in the rust belt washes out it looks like there's actually an, a trend towards the democrats in the rust belt but i'm confident that that is actually wrong that there's still a trend in the republicans in the rust belt it's just the Hispanic shifting so much changes things. Changes things quite dramatically. So with that, what does the trends look like to me? Well, let us paint, or let me paint a picture. So this is a blank map. I'm only going to color in states that I think are going to trend. I think we're going to see Georgia trend blue. We're going to see North Carolina trend blue. North Carolina will trend less blue than Georgia. And those are the only two that I think we're going to see meaningful movement to 28. Now, there might be some hit or misses elsewhere. There might be some movements elsewhere. But those are the big two that are going to move. Maybe you could say South Carolina very brief, possibly. But I'm doubting it. And when I say move, I don't necessarily mean the Democrats are going to win South Carolina. Or they're not going to win, necessarily going to win Georgia. They're necessarily going to win North Carolina. It's just those states will probably be more competitive. So, for example, the, the worst case scenario, I think the 2028 Republican might win Georgia by less than a percent. Less than a percent. They might win North Carolina by less than two. That kind of thing. That's the worst case for the Dems. That's where I see those two trending. You might see if the Democrats claw back with uh, Hispanics, you might see something like Arizona or Texas swing Democrat. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change my coloring scheme. It's probably gonna, I'm gonna use he's like this. So these two are probably gonna happen. These two are a long shot. They have to reverse a massive trend. Sorry, a massive swing in one demographic. But if they do that, that might happen. And if that case, they might also gain some ground back in Florida. That's really the only prospects I see 
in the short term for the Democrats. I'll get into long term in a moment. For the Republicans, I see kind of the same consolidation here in the Rust Belt. I think it's going to get a little safer. You might see movement in Minnesota. It was closer this time than it was in 2020, but it was further than 2016. Now that could be a Tim Walls effect, boosting the ticket in Minnesota. So we might see Minnesota move, but I'm a little skeptical. But where I really think we're going to see movement is New York. And maybe a little bit potential in New Jersey. Though I think New Jersey, now that it's been aware that this movement has occurred in New Jersey, it might be clawed back by the Democrats. They might smarten up and run better candidates, do better job. <clears throat> but New York is the one I think there is going to be big movement in. And the reason for that is New York City's losing population. And the rest of the state is gaining population. And the rest of the state... Now, this is because people are fleeing New York to the rest of the state, for the record. But the rest of the state is gaining population, but it's also getting redder. I believe... I don't have the numbers offhand, but I believe Trump actually won New York State if you remove New York City. Now, obviously, that's kind of a stupid thing to say. New York City is like 9 million people. But... That kind of gives you an idea. That's the first time in a long time Republicans actually won upstate New York. And that hasn't happened in a long time. Uh, might not have happened in my lifetime, but I'd have to, I'd have to double check uh, Bush 2004. That might be the, the only time, but I'd double check that. But you don't have prepped here. So what I really think in the grand scheme of things, and perhaps... Connecticut might swing a little bit, or perhaps Virginia might swing a little bit. I should finish those up for the Republicans. And you might notice here, as I have colored this, that roughly speaking, a very similar share of population and a very similar share of electoral votes is swinging. That's not a coincidence. That's usually how things should work. In a properly functioning two-party system, Unless one party runs an awful candidate versus a really good candidate, swings should be, on average, mirroring each other. If you see someone making a forecast saying, aha, the Republicans are going to win all of these states and these ones are not going to shift Democrat, that's a wish cast. If someone's saying these ones are all going to shift Democrat and these ones won't shift Republican, that's also a wish cast. Now, some might disagree with my assessment and label different states as moving. And that's fine. You don't have to agree with my two-second analysis right here. I have reasoning behind it, but I'm not going to explain it because it'll be out of the scope of the video. But the key here is that movements and trends roughly mirror each other. Because that's how politics works. If one party was gaining net ground in the country, that means the other party isn't doing anything. And that's silly. That's not going to happen. And by doing nothing, I mean they're not changing their politics. They're not changing their strategies. They're not trying to appeal to different groups. If one party is just willing to lose, that's just... I guess that could happen, but it would be silly. It would be silly. And it's not going to happen. They, they are mirrored, again, because one party is going to do something and another party is going to counter it by doing something else. And what we're really, I think, seeing in the U.S. most easily, but across the country and the world as a whole, is politics in the 20th century, especially in the liberal epoch, so roughly 1930-ish to roughly now-ish, maybe 2020, 2016, depending on how you want to call it. In that time period, coalitions were mostly formed on economics. So you had the free marketers versus the state interventionists. This is a very broadly oversimplification. 
But what we're seeing right now is a big political realignment because things are moving along social issues, not economic issues. Which is why you're seeing a lot of suburbs swing Democrat and a lot of rural areas, a lot of working class areas swing Republican. Working class people and rural people are more socially conservative than suburbanites. It's also why the Republicans are destroying or dominating the exurbs. Similar deal. Exurbanites are more socially conservative than suburb suburbanites or urbanites. And you can see this again with the platforms. Just compare Kamala Harris to Trump. And the economics is very confusing on who's actually for what on economics. Some things Kamala Harris is for are more your classical free market year stuff. Free trade, for example. Some of the stuff Trump is for is also like that. Tax cuts, deregulation. But other things like tariffs are not a classical free marketeer thing. And then you have a bunch of things that Harris wants to do, like wealth taxes. Or, sorry, unrealized capital gains taxes. An asinine idea, but outside, I digress. <clears throat> so that's really the general gist here. Now, I will say, having mapped out these mirrored trends, I do think things are going to slightly favor the Republicans. But only in popular vote terms. I think going, especially once you get into 2030s, the Republicans are probably going to win the popular vote more often than they don't win the popular vote. But the Electoral College will ensure that this will probably still be close to 50-50 winning. Or in other words, the Republicans, when they win, will probably win more vote than when the Democrats win. And that's, again, likely going to be a consequence of this kind of realignment thing. Whereas before the Democrats were destroying, blowing out states like New York, California, being super competitive in Florida. Now, they're not competitive in Florida. They're not very competitive in Texas. They're competitive in New York. And you start seeing these big population states swing like that, and things change. Things are different. Who's dominating the popular vote is going to be different. But because the electoral system in the U.S. is not by popular vote, that doesn't really affect who's actually going to do better or worse. And now just once again, just caveat for any viewers looking at this at home, I am not saying in 2028 New York is going Republican. I'm just saying it's probably going to move more than the other states that trend Republican. And they'll trend Republican election over election, not relative to the nation, in my theory. But obviously things can change. There's four years. A lot could happen. Maybe Trump flops really hard. And obviously that would change things. Trends are only indicative. They're not actually predictive. You can make good guesses by looking at trends, but just because a trend is there doesn't mean it will happen. Again, nothing is static in politics. So then, where does that leave us? Well, I think we are going to be entering, and I'll discuss this more at some point in a future date, a time frame where the Republicans are the stronger party electorally. The likely, once they smarten themselves up, because there is a bunch of issues the Republican Party has under the hood that's holding it back pretty hard, but once they smarten up, I think you're going to see them dominate the Senate. They're going to do probably win the House more often than not. The size of majority will depend, but they'll probably win more often than they lose in the House. And part of that is, again, due to how the voters are swinging. If we go, oops, I don't know why whenever you resize a tab, it has to change your slide thing, your scroll distance, but whatever. Bad programming is bad. I digress. So this is the 2024 exit polls from Edison. 
neatly formatted here. And what I will compare this to is the 2020 US results, because I think that will be the most useful. Uh, actually, let's break it up like this side by side. So there's a couple things here that are worth noting that changed election over election. First, let's look at the female vote. Now, there is a theory people have had for a while that if you put a woman on the ballot, women will vote for her. Does not appear to be the case. Women swung more towards Trump than they did, than men did. Trump only gained about four or five points with men. He gained nearly 10 with women. Going from deep, or sorry, I looked at the wrong label here. Apologies. He went from D plus 15 with women to D plus 8. And they went from R plus 8 with men to R plus 13. So a five point shift in men, but an eight point shift in women. And if you go back to 2016, which I can show you as well, because these are all the same exit polls, we see 2016 a very similar situation where Clinton does a little bit better among women than Harris did, but not much. Worse than Biden. She only wins women by 13, Biden won by 15. Trump does do better among men than he does against Biden. But again, it doesn't really appear to be the case that women will turn out specifically to vote for a woman. A woman. That's that theory doesn't seem to hold status in the US. But the main things of interest here that I want to highlight is there's twofold. And we're gonna look at gender by ethnicity. So there is discussion, and I've seen a lot about, aha, the black men swing in the US. Harris won black men by 56 points. Biden won by 60. We're talking about a four point swing. That's really not that much. Trump actually gained six points nationally. So again, I just talked about, I don't like swing relative to national, but that's not a very big movement. Yes, he did gain with them, but not, not in a consequential way. He actually lost among black women. Harris won by 84 points, whereas Biden only won by 81. But the big difference was Hispanic men. Biden won Latinos by 23 points. Trump won them by 12. It's a 35 point swing. Biden won Latina women by 39 points. Harris only won by 22. 17 point swing. Now, interestingly, white women slightly moved towards Harris, going from Trump plus 11 to Trump plus 8. So perhaps that, that there might be the quote unquote Dobbs effect people have been talking about this entire time, which I will once again notice or mention, and I, I was, have said the entire series. Abortion is a losing issue for the Democrats. This was a very core part of the Democrat platform, a huge part of their campaign, and they lost the worst they've lost in 20 years. This is the worst Democrat performance in 20 years. 20. And this was front and center in their campaign. And they did not, on average across the whole population, actually gain voters among women. So the idea that women are going to come out and vote for abortion is just wrong. That did not happen. 
It obviously did not happen. And then the other Koch people were saying to try to defend this position is, aha, the young people will vote to defend abortion. No, they didn't. Under 25s, Biden won by 34 points, Harris won by 12. 25 to 30s, Harris won by 8, Biden won by 11. 30 to 39s, Biden won by 5, Harris won by 4. 40 to 49s, Biden won by 10, Trump won by 2. The only age group that meaningfully moved to the Democrats was 65 plus. That went from Trump plus 5 to neutral. And if you break it down by, we unfortunately, in 2020, I don't believe they did give us or did break out uh, men by women. Or sorry, age by gender, unfortunately. But in 2024, we do have age by gender here. And we see Trump won under 30 men by two points and only lost under 30 women by 24 points. Now notice, that's lower than the average of these two demos for Biden. In other words, it's not just that Trump won under 30 men. He clearly must have done better with under 30 women too. Because on the first order approximation, he got about 60% of the under 30 vote and Trump got about uh, 37%. So, sorry, he did about at... He did at minimum the same among under 30 women. Unless you want to say in 2020 there was a very big dichotomy, in which case he does better with under 30 women in this election. So I'll, I'll just phrase it better. In 2020, Biden got approximately 61 to 37 among under 30s. In 2024, Trump... Gets 61 37 among under 30 women and 49 47 among under 30 men. So either under 30 men used to vote like under 30 women, or both groups voted significantly to the left. So either way, either under 30 women did not move in this election, or they made, went more right wing. I think it is much more likely that in 2020, under 30 women were slightly more Democrat and under 30 men were also slightly more Democrat, but not they did not vote the same way. So in other words, men slightly voted Republican in 2020. So which means under 30 women moved Republican. So once again, women did not go out to vote for Harris because of abortion. Did not happen. Did not happen. It manifestly did not happen. And the final one I want to highlight here in this exit poll is vote share, vote by people's belief on abortion. And we can compare this to 2020. Now in 2020, 42% wanted abortion illegal in some or all cases of people who actually voted. In 2024, only 32% did. So maybe some people's minds changed. Maybe people dropped out of the electorate. Unclear. We don't have 100% turnout. So we can't say necessarily... <coughs> Apologies. We can't say necessarily there has been a big shift in how people identify. There is much more reason why pro-abortion voters to vote now than in 2020. So it could just be the electorate's changed. But the important thing to illustrate here is Biden won the important demographic in this case, the legal in most cases, by 38 points in 2020. It was a tied demo in 2024. And it's tied 
with a higher percentage of the electorate. So in other words, since there's reason to believe more people voted who were pro-abortion in 2024 because of Dobbs, that did not actually help Harris. Either the 26% of the electorate who were support legal in most cases in 2020 shifted super hard to the Republicans or the two people, the new people who turned out who support legal in most cases supported Trump. <clears throat> so to put this in a different perspective, this is again a losing issue for Harris because the one group she was trying to win, she did 38 points worse than Biden. 38. In 2020, there was doubt if Roe would ever be overturned. In 2024, Roe is gone. It's been gone for two years. Abortion is a losing issue for the Democrats. Manifestly. That is one of the core parts of this campaign for them. And they completely lost. And they didn't just lose the election. The exit poll is very clear. They lost the demographics they were betting on winning. They were betting on winning, legal in most cases. They were betting on winning young women. They were betting on winning all women. They lost ground with all three groups. And at the same time, they also got blown out by Latinos. And I think a large part of why Latinos shifted so much in this election, which was possibly the deciding factor in this election, or at least a very critical factor in this election, if Latinos did not swing this much, Harris probably would have won Arizona and Nevada. Sure, that's only 17 points, but bringing Trump from 312 down to 295 greatly weakens the case he has for a decisive victory. And then you could also argue there are Latinos in Pennsylvania. There are Latinos in Georgia. There are Latinos in North Carolina. And when I say there are there, I mean like a meaningful enough percentage that it could do something. So a big swing in those groups could also change something. Maybe it's not a win in those states, but it could be narrow. You don't see like 15 years of trying to turn Texas blue gone in a single night. And I think this swing in Latinos is in no small part because of this focus on abortion. Latinos are a, on the average, quite religious, very Catholic group. And notable fact about Catholics is the Catholic Church completely and totally condemns abortion. Is that the main reason why this one? No, probably not. But it is probably a contributing factor. The other big contributing factor is immigration, which I won't stress too much here because I don't, I think it's more self-explanatory. I think most people here should get this by now. But a Immigration is a massive losing issue in 2024. There's a reason why Keir Starmer, Justin Trudeau are running away from immigration. It is a losing issue. People do not like it. They have never liked it. When 10, 15, 20 years ago, when people said, oh, I support immigration, that's because they personally hadn't been affected by it. And as soon as people are affected by it, they don't like it. Wow. Shocking, right? But as things go on, time regresses, it affects more and more people. Because that's exactly what immigration is. It's just increasing the population. And I will caveat this for anyone at home. The problem for voters isn't that, per se, new people are into the country. It's that the population has increased. And people do not actually like population growth. They don't. It doesn't, it usually hurts you when population growth happens, especially when it happens by bringing in people who can actually compete with you. If it's happening because there's babies, 
The babies don't meaningfully affect your life as an adult. Bringing in a different adult who can who needs a house, who needs a job, who needs health care, that competes with you. That reduces the scarcity or increases the scarcity of those three commodities. There's only so many jobs. There's only so many healthcare workers. There's only so many houses. Yeah, we can do increase the supply of all of them, but not to the degree that every country in the West population is growing. Largely because of immigration. But I digress. That's, I think, a pretty self-explanatory thing. People don't like it. They voted strongly against it. I'm not sure if it's captured here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, immigration. 11% of the electorate. And Trump won 99. 92-9. 81 point margin on immigration. Remarkable. Just truly a remarkable factor. And yeah, you can say here, just for my critics, yeah, Harris won abortion votes by 49%. People who care about abortion. Yep. It was their number one voting issue. Yep. Those are all Democrats. She won Democrats. That doesn't change anything. The only people who cared about it People who were already voting Democrat. And again, the important consideration on immigration, sorry, on abortion, is this group of people. This group of people, the legal in most cases, they are not a nuanced, sophisticated group of people. They're not like, well, sometimes this or this. No, these are people who are either very mushy or they have a very specific line in mind that's not all legal or all banned. Usually they fall into one of four categories, six week, 12 week, 15 week, or viability. Almost this entire 33% is in one of those categories. Almost all of them. So the actual position Kamala Harris ran on alienates those voters as much as Trump's does, which is why it's split 50-50. It's not a winning issue for Harris or the Democrats or anyone else unless they decide to actually invoke median voter theorem and try to chase the median vote, then it might help them. But in reality, people don't actually do that. That's not how politicians actually work. The politicians just go for what they believe in for the most part. Or what their voters believe in, sorry, their backers believe in, the other people in the elite of the party, that is. But I digress, that's a, di that's a different topic for a different time. But I'll just finish this here. This election was both very predictable and very boring. There was a lot of discussion really early on about, oh, is Harris going to win? Oh, she surged very heavily. That surge that occurred. I'll actually bring up the data for it because it'll be easier to explain. This surge you see right here, that's the new leader plus convention bump. In other words, it's fake. That wasn't a surge. Or I guess a better way to phrase this, this trough from Trump never happened. It didn't happen. Trump was like right here, and he stayed right there, around 50%. Harris was never above 50%. Not once in the entire race was she actually above 50%. And... For those of you at home, you can look back in my trends and my model. At no point did I have Harris above 50%. At no point did I have Trump below 48%. Well, except here. Never mind. Below 47%. <laughs> These polls down here that are putting him 
low 46, 45, 44 range, or sorry, 45, 46 range. Those were wrong. And they're wrong for a reason I touch on all the time. There is a very normal and average phenomenon in polling. They miss two groups of people on a regular basis. They miss rural voters, and they miss renters. In this particular election, they missed both. They missed rural voters in that they underestimated how much they're going to vote for Trump. And they missed renters in how little of them were going to actually vote. The reason why New York shifted so much is because the Democrats lost like a half a million votes in New York City. They lost votes in LA. They lost votes in Philadelphia. They lost votes in every major city in the entire country. And that's not because Trump won those voters. They just didn't vote. They didn't go to the ballot box. Turnout was lower in those districts. Because the renters didn't vote. Because the renters saw huge inflation, particularly on rents, and they saw the Democrats offered them nothing. And they're like, why do we bother? And they didn't bother. Huzzah. So yes, the reason why this polling was so bad is because they missed both groups that are really easy to miss, and they missed them both in a direction that favored the Democrats. That's pretty typical because at this stage, because of the coalition realignments, Democrat voters are actually high propensity. They're, they've lost most of the low propensity voters except for renters. So when you miss the low propensity voters, the ones who don't answer polls, uh, turns out you're actually missing Republicans. But with that, I bid you guys adieu, and I'll see you next time with something else.